Welcome back to California Life Podcast. And today we are delighted to have our very, very special guest in our studio, Miss Angie Wood from the Wood Public Affairs. Yes, thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here today. Thank you for coming. Um, today we decided to talk about a few very important social uh, issues, I guess. Education, first of all, and the second challenge that we all face is the, the drug problem. Yes, for yeah. sure. Um, when we talked with you during our last lunch, mm -hmm. uh, we connected a lot on this educational thing, which uh, as we both felt in the same, the same way, uh, it's a little bit outdated. And so many kids, they are pushed away by the system, but actually they are the flags that the system is outdated and it doesn't work. Yeah, I definitely agree. Uh, as we were discussing at lunch, we have a system that has been in place for hundreds of years. Right. And we have an economy, a livelihood that has been rapidly changing. And we're leaving behind students who don't need to be left behind. Right. Because we're targeting them by, you know, pointing out things that we're calling maladies like ADHD and other things that are causing disruptions in class when I think it's actually a cry for students who are learning in a different way and need the opportunity to have the educational environment change. Right. Uh, to the point um, when um, some of my either students or mentees um, back in 2017, 18, um, they, were, they were told that they have ADHD, I told them you have ADA, which is attention deficit advantage. You don't take nonsense. Yeah. And I wish you could see the, the change on their face, the smile which came up because they felt like, okay, that's something really cool. That's something that is efficient and I'm different because so many people just you know, buy things which media tells them. And uh, lives of many of these kids has changed since then. Um, and I have also seen, unfortunately, uh, those, uh, you know, a few examples of the kids which were pushed by the system and they are lost in a way. Yeah. They were, I guess, more fragile. Yeah, for sure. Um, but in any case, when we meet with, with them and, um, look, I tell them, look, it's not that you fail the system. It's the system failed you because you have your creativity you have your vision just develop it exactly exactly um, I love what you say with the ADA I would tell I have four children wow. and two of which um, have different levels of ADHD actually three of which ADA uh, yeah ADA exactly I'm gonna use that I'm gonna tell them that today ADA um, one of my children has found her outlet with cheer being able to use her workouts that are like three three four times a week, nice. multiple hours, and it's allowed her to quote unquote fit into the mold. My other two have had a few more challenges in the system, but my eldest, he's the one I used to tell when he was younger, I'm like, you're Superman. Right. You have the ability to see and hear so many things and you just need to focus in your superpower on the things that you need to get done. Yeah. But I'm gonna definitely tell him that about ADA today. But the system has definitely left a lot of students behind that and they're categorizing them and labeling them in a way that's making them feel that they don't belong when the truth is is the system isn't making it so they have a place to fit in um, it's a very boxed off system as we know and those of us who can go into the mode and fit into the box we tend to do well you know but there is a space for those who have extra creativity and their minds think differently uh, for example, my oldest, I'll go back to him. Right. He, he, I remember this one time in fourth grade, we had, I was homeschooling him for a while and I placed him back into the public setting. And his math teacher was saying that he was failing all of his times table charts right. over and over and over, zero out of a hundred, zero out of a hundred. And I asked the teacher, have you ever tested him auditorily? Have you allowed him to just answer the questions verbally? And the teacher's like, no, but I know that he won't do it. I'm like, I understand that you say that, but I have been teaching my son for
for the last two years, and I know that he knows his timetables. Right. And so when I pushed back and allowed the teacher to then test him auditorily, he aced it. He got 100 out of 100. And the teacher was like, oh, well, that's a fluke. And I'm like, well, can you please test him again and see if, if you do it auditorily, if he will pass the test. And once again, he did with flying colors. But my son has still struggled in school, particularly in almost with every area where he has to do a written test. But if you speak with him and if you put him in a different environment where he doesn't feel like it's the pressure of a school setting, he flourishes and he thrives. That's a fantastic example and, 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 and a beautiful story. Um, I don't have any kids of mine, so mm -hmm. it definitely feels differently. I have, a, a, uh, I have three mentees from the Life Academy show, which I mentioned yeah. to you. But I bet having your own kid feels differently. And um, I have this question, which I think it's, it's stuck in, you know, behind uh, my mind. Why is that such a problem of the kids, of the people, I guess, in general, uh, that they want to fit in? Hmm. I never felt it. That's why, to me, it's... it's Different. Uh, Interesting. Yeah. I mean, I feel like it's the... I don't know if it's our American culture, the, the pressure. We have... I think it's, we have a, a whole bunch of standards that we have to go into once you go into the American public school system, right? You have, oh, can you get perfect attendance? And mm -hmm. they took that away after COVID because they couldn't keep the requirements of perfect right. attendance. Um, you have all the different award systems. And you also have within the classroom setting, just the way that it's set up, it's, you know, you must get that A, you must get that B, and if you don't, you're... I don't want to say stupid, but that's that's almost like the feeling that is placed on the students. Right. And you'd want to be able to go up on stage and get the award at the end of the month, you know. And I think that's where that pressure of fitting in goes because you want to get awarded. We all want, you know, that little pat on the back. And when you don't get that, I think it makes it feel like you're other, you know. And it makes you even more feel like, okay, I'm not fitting into the box because these other students are getting the award, they're getting all the different things that, you know, maybe I want that too, but I can't for some reason. How do you deal with these situations with your kids? Let's say if your kid comes and says, well, I wanted that award, but it didn't get it. And at the same time, uh, I would say in majority of cases, it's all participation medals it's not an actual mm. one champion it's <laughs> at least one first champion two of the second places mm -hmm. three of the f third and you name it yeah it's 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 an illusion mm. and it's some sort of detachment from the reality of life because in life you either win or you lose mm. and the, the the sooner you begin learning from losing the better you'll be in life mm. oh my god that's that's yeah. my belief and that's how i i grew up you know treating myself how, how do you communicate with your kids and that could be a great example for for those who are seeking for some knowledge oh goodness so having four children i have four totally different personalities i have the student who really really wants to do well all the time and interestingly enough he's the one who really is succeeding the best in school because mm -hmm. he just is like I must get that A, and if I don't get that A, I'm not doing well. Um, with my other two that have really struggled, it's more of, I, I, I focus a lot on effort. Like, did you really try? Are we trying our best? And uh, I also had to realign what I thought success was. Because for me, I, I wasn't the superior student, but I always did well in school. And so it was hard for me at first to make the readjustment to my students, my children, not doing what I thought that they would be able to easily attain. Mm -hmm. And the learning curve of figuring out why. Um, I don't want to get too off topic, but it w there was a very big learning curve of understanding the behaviors that one of my children was exhibiting was not his fault. Not saying that I'm not putting blame on him, but that he was being placed in a system that wasn't there to help him. Right. Because we didn't understand what was going on. They didn't understand what was going on. And he got diagnosed in about seventh grade with ADHD where we were able to understand, okay, we need to teach you differently. I need to talk to you differently. And I think 
I mean, taking, we know that there's many facets of learning, right? right? There's the auditory learning, there's the first physical learner, there's the visual learner, and all the other types of learners. And I had to learn how my student learned, how right. my son learned, to teach him in a way that he understood, um, playing off of things that come about when you have this feeling that you, I don't know, the, the school system was making him feel like he wasn't enough. Mm -hmm. and um, trying to, you know, go with affirmations, t telling him that he is enough, and helping him to learn the ways that he needed to learn, right. um, and trying to pull away the anxiety that was coming with the school setting. Um, and that was with one student. Another stu child of mine, he is one who is my quiet one, and he slips under the radar really easily because he has the ability to sit quietly, not disturb anyone, teachers love him, but his um, fear of not doing things perfectly has made it so he wouldn't turn in work. And so it's still this struggle of, no, you turn it in, You're, you've done the work. Don't fear what the grade will be, because we have to fail sometimes. Yeah. Right. We have to fail to grow. We have to fail to learn. Right. I heard this quote the other day that says the difference between a winner and a loser is that the winner kept trying after they failed. Right. And so now we're trying to change this mindset of, OK, how do we go from people who are failing to people who are winning? Right. Which means that we have to keep trying. Right. Right. Beautifully said. <laughs> You mentioned you have uh, two sons. Three sons. Three sons mm -hmm. and one daughter. Um, I guess you would recall uh, when we met during our lunch, I shared with you one of the stories which inspired me to film uh, Modern Kung Fu was when uh, parents brought in to my office in Los Angeles uh, their daughters. It was two different families. Yeah. They do not know each other from different schools, different areas. Um, and both girls, 12 and 14 years old, they... Uh, went through depression, they had suicidal attempts twice, and most of the reasons that both had was improper treatment from the boys in their classes. Mm. Um, how do you um, educate your boys uh, to be, to grow into real men? Oh my goodness. That one is, it, it's been a, a joint effort with my husband and I. Um, during our Interestingly enough, the educational journey has come a lot of journeys on, you know, being a real man. And my husband is a very good example of what it is to be a man and what it is to be a father and how do we treat women. Right. We had my eldest son when he was in eighth grade. He was at a school that we were trying to help with him educationally, but ended up having that we taught a lot more lessons about being about manhood in the situation because the school system or the school he would he ended up attending had a very low ratio of uh, dual parent households mm -hmm. and so while he was in this school um, there were situations where he was coming home saying things that were not reflective of how we were raising him um, and one instance was on one of his Instagram post, he had posted something that was not appropriate towards a young lady. And we talked to him about what was going on, and he literally came home and said to us, Mom, the kids are calling me a simp. I'm like, what do you mean they're calling you a simp? Like, they're calling me a simp because I respect women, and I'm treating them kindly, and I'm being made fun of. And we're like, because you're treating people kindly and being respectful to women? He's like, yeah. That's, that's what they're calling me. And so he's like, so I have to be rude to girls now. And I'm like, no, <laughs> that is not what you do because of this. And we ha he had to learn a very hard lesson where we literally <laughs> had him on his social media, put, I am a simp and I love it. Because we're like, you're going to be respectful to women. That is, we, the, in our family, we are respectful to women. Right. And we treat them with respect. And this is a part of what being a man is. A man protects. A man guides. Um, but it's been a, a very interesting process raising boys in this culture that is either making softening what manhood looks like 
or making it overly aggressive and degrading women. Right, right. It is a very interesting um, environment, especially to me when I, you know, I'm European. Mm -hmm. And when I came and started diving into the culture, um, went through this process of assimilation, which yeah. is pretty, you know, <laughs> fast for me. It was like, well, okay, that's not how my grandfather, my father taught me. No, it's yeah. not going to work. Um, when you... Um, taught your son to make the post that I'm a simp and I love it. <laughs> how did he feel and how was his, his I don't know, uh, transformation maybe change? What was his reaction? Well, his reaction at first was very, you know, embarrassed. It's like, oh my gosh, like everybody at school is going to see this. But we made him keep it up for about two weeks and we saw his behaviors change because then he realized, oh, there's a standard I must uphold. And it was a great example to his brother, who was one grade behind him, who was like, okay, definitely not going to go down that road. Um, I understand what it means and how we're supposed to treat and behave women, behave towards women. And over time, we've really seen them grow. And the son that I have now, he's um, in 10th grade now, is night and day different over this change. And it wasn't just that one time. There's been multiple instances okay. of having to train and help him to understand the correct way to treat young women and the correct way to behave as a man. From the simple things in our family, like opening the door for women. Right. This is a, it is a, a thing that we do. My husband literally will have me sit in the car. My boys have to walk all the way around the car to make sure that they open my door. You know, simple, simple graces to that too. If your sister's in trouble, you protect her. Right. And they are very big and very, very protective over their sister as we've taught them that this is the way that, at least in our family, we raise a man. That's fantastic. Um, when you were talking to your son uh, about this simp topic, um, did he share with you what is the reason why being rude or mean is popular? Oh gosh, yes. They were, they, it, it breaks my heart. Like this is how women want to be treated. That was their seventh and eighth grade mentality was that you can't be kind to a woman because that's not how a woman wants to be treated. That's what the media says. That's, <laughs> and you think about, I mean, my children, particularly at that point, were really, really being engaged in music that was edifying that message. And you think of shows that edify that message. And when you watch, yeah, movies, that message is being portrayed. And it just really shows how much media can have an influence on the lives, particularly of children, these minds that are growing. What do you think of um, the messages that are, again, told by the media or through the media that uh, ladies like more of uh, crazy behaving guys who are unpredictable, uh, they do some crazy but cool stuff <laughs> instead of calm and um, uh, reliable and steady um, type of men? Oh gosh, well, I would really say that, I mean, the media is portraying this message and the, fa the hard part is that it's, it's being consumed, right. right? Because if it wasn't consumed, they wouldn't, it wouldn't make money. If it wasn't making money, it, they wouldn't continue to put it out there. It's a vicious cycle, I'd say, um, that is continuing both stereotypes, um, I think particularly in the black culture, the stereotype of the fatherless home, the man who treats his woman uh, inappropriately. I have in recent times seen more shows that are trying to change that narrative and it's appreciated. But sadly, a lot of music, which is what a lot of the, the kids, students, my children have listened to, is portraying this message that is keeping the positive message of the reliable, calm man who is there to provide and protect away. And I even sadly say that when those types of figureheads come to the forefront, they are then misaligned and they're called bad for saying that they're standing up for proper manhood and what it looks like to be a husband and a father. And they're called the simp because they are the reliable man who is there to do the job of 
husband, father, protector. And then they're, they're then mischaracterized. Have your kids ever tried to do martial arts? When they were younger, we tried Taekwondo. My husband has been wanting to get um, my second born into wrestling, mm -hmm. but they have not. I, I would, I think it would be an interesting thing for them to try at this point. Definitely. I think that would be um, a very nice tool to get rid of the simp situation. Because mm. when you can get a punch back, yeah, that's people would true. think twice to call <laughs> you something or not. Yeah, that's very, very true. Uh, it's, it's very um, interesting that you mentioned about the stereotypes, which again is pretty, pretty um, well pushed in Hollywood about a single mother family situation or disrespect. Um, a, a good friend of mine, Princess Vashon in, uh, in, in Los Angeles, she was one of the heroes of my little documentary, um, uh, Successful Women of Hollywood. Yeah. Um, she has an amazing husband. She has beautiful kids, extremely successful daughters. Mm -hmm. They play basketball. They, they do so many things. One of the daughters I remember was in modeling um, a couple of years ago. And it's just a beautiful example, yeah. and we don't see that. Yeah, my gosh, right? It's, we have to continue to try to push out. And that's why I like what you were talking about with the media that you're doing, is putting out those positive messages. Because I think our society, if they were given more opportunity to see it, would engage in it more. If they saw those examples more, they would reflect them. Right. More, right, because we become like a pond, a reflection of what's around us. And I'm happy for things that you're doing in that way where you're really kind of changing a narrative and putting out more positive examples of media. Because if we have more of that, it can hopefully put that, put that little ripple effect in that pond and ripple out to more people making those positive changes and reflecting those positive images. Right, right. Well, that's the goal of our production, our team, to put out family values. And we're not contradicting, we're not bringing any hate to anyone's choice. Yeah. Um, to erase all these stereotypes or anything that divides people instead of bringing them together. Mm -hmm. um, we grew up in Europe, yeah. in, in the families, in the communities, which we didn't have that hate back then. We didn't have any... Uh, racial or any other division. Everybody came together, they worked together. Whether we had students from Africa or from India, they were great doctors. Yeah. And people loved them and nobody even thought about, you know, dividing and calling each other names and hating each other. And uh, that's one of the, the other things which together with the team we are trying to accomplish because we came with pure heart, pretty naive. Yeah. And I guess that little naiveness is still pushing us towards bringing people together because you have resources i have resources together we can accomplish a project together which is great for the community if we fight i'm in a destruction you're in destruction the project <laughs> is not working everybody is losing exactly. what's the point yeah for sure going towards the destructions another topic which uh is is a big pain in my heart the drug issue oh, gosh, and yeah. last time when we met you mentioned a specific one which was uh, fentanyl. Yes, fentanyl. I have a friend of a friend who lost their child last year. Um, the child was I think 13 years old from fentanyl. That's pretty young. It's so young. You're it's not supposed so to young. drink alcohol before 21. Yes. And, and wow. a loss of a life at that age and to be honest, um, I have seen firsthand lots of experiences of people under age getting their hands on things that they shouldn't. Right. And it is an epidemic that I feel is... I'm looking forward to seeing what our society is going to do to try to change course. Right. Because right now we have the legalization of a lot of substances that as these substances become legal, it makes it easier to get into the hands of younger and younger populations. Right. I mean, you think of, you know, the stories when I was a child were like, oh my gosh, a child like drank too much cough syrup. Oh no. You know, but now it's no, a child 
I heard a horrid story right. about um, a mother who was putting fentanyl in her baby's bottle and the baby died because wow. she was trying to calm the baby down. Okay. And we have to have better regulation on these things. I understand that as our society is changing and morphing, we have this understanding that maybe we are progressing faster than we are. But I think we have to also keep at, in mind the younger populations of people. And a, a saying that we have in our culture is, how are the children doing? And if we don't see that the children are doing well, we need to look up and see, well, how are the adults doing? Right. And is this correlation between the children and adults? What's the bridge between the two? And I think the use of substance, substance abuse um, is something that we're seeing rise in both the teen population and the adult population. And how are the children doing? And I don't think in terms of the rise in substance abuse, I don't think they're doing well. How do you um, educate your kids in terms of not using any substances? What is your approach? Because you have a beautiful family, an amazing example for everyone. And um, I've, I've heard these stories of drug use from you know, kids in the neighborhood to UCLA and Stanford. Yeah. And kids being... Uh, I would say silly, I'm not judging though, mm -hmm. but um, you know, when you are at Stanford or UCLA, mm -hmm. your housing, your food, your car, everything is covered by the parents yeah. and you're depressed mm -hmm. and you take drugs to you know, get out of this reality because of the stress. What is the stressing you out that much? Yeah, I, it's, I have to be very transparent in saying that it, you think that it can't hit you and it can. Yeah. And we've had some firsthand experiences, some scary experiences, even in our home that were, we never thought it could be us. And it, it became us. And right. it was a very hard battle of trying to, well, we're, we're a Christian family. So a whole lot of prayer had to come into our home when some of these issues that we never thought would hit us, hit us. Um, also, you have to think of stressors that are going on in, in homes and in families. I think that um, the approach we took was lots and lots of conversations, going to counseling, both children and adults, um, and trying to get to the core of things like depression. Why are you depressed? For us, it was very hard because we saw our kids, they have everything. <laughs> and so it was very hard, and more than we ever had. Right. And so it, it hard for us to, one, say, how can you be dealing with depression, be dealing with things when you have so much? And taking back and realizing that sometimes it really is the peer pressure of culture the peer pressure of failure, you know, um, that we're digging down on them and once again affirming that that's, you're more than your grades. You're more than what your friends think you are. And your friends don't control where you're going next. You right. do. Right. And you have to take that personal responsibility of your, you have to make decisions for you and where you're going. And if your friends are leading you down these paths, they're not your friends. And we have to make hard friend choices, hard household choices, because we were also a home that allowed everybody in. Right. And we had to make some hard choices of being a lot more selective of those we allowed in our home. If you're not going to be on, in line with the values. the values of our home. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Um, you just mentioned that the kids have everything. Maybe that's the reason. I know. I know. Because we didn't have anything. We had. <laughs> I, I love the story of uh, Steve Harvey. Yeah. He said that when he wanted a pony, his dad uh, gave him a bicycle, put the, the wig on, and there you go. 
and now his daughter wants a pony and she has a few. Mm -hmm. um, or uh, Shaquille O'Neal when he uh, was uh, he was giving an interview and he said that the kids know that it's not they are rich, it's he is rich. Yeah. And they won't get anything. And a lot of celebrities, they do, do these things because uh, I, I believe they, they realize that it will keep their kids away from the trouble. Mm -hmm. Look at Jackie Chan's son. He, he was caught with drugs, with all of the, yeah. not the best behavior, let's mm -hmm. put it this way, just because he's a son of a very Famous influential yeah. and rich, rich person. How do you think, as you know, you're a mother, mm -hmm. I, I'm not, I don't feel the same way, yeah. obviously. Uh, how can we change the situation to better? Yeah, so it's, it's a conscious choice. We have found many times that we have to realign our our structure of our home to as we see these behaviors come to play and it's we're very we're very frank with our kids i tell them all the time like my oldest is 16. i tell them this is the first time i've ever raised a 16 year old so you have to give me grace and understanding that i might create rules and standards but i might have to change them because they didn't work and so our kids are very amiable and understanding that sometimes we might change something drastically. We might say that, yes, this is the way that things are going to go and they're gonna, we're, we're doing it this way. But our big saying we have is things change well, depending on time, circumstance, and behavior. Right. Sometimes the timing doesn't work out and something's not going to have to change. Sometimes the circumstances change and they're not working out and sometimes your behavior really sucks so it's not going to happen you know and we've had to make that adjustment as we see behaviors we're like okay you're you, you're too entitled right now <laughs> right so we have to take some things back from you because we do not want to raise an individual who believes that you deserve these things you have to work hard for your father's working his butt off for everything he's giving us yeah. so you have to make sure you're working hard too I remember with my daughter, she um, she does competition cheerleading, which oh, is nice. a sport that takes us all over the place. We're we're going to Florida in May for her to compete for Beautiful. for the world championship called the Summit, and um, she wants all these outfits, you know. And I was like, well, every book you read is an outfit you get, you know. Just trying to change what what is it that you how how are you going to earn these things instead right. of being given them, you right? Know? Right. That's a beautiful example. It's it's important to learn how to earn things instead of just yeah. have them, you know, being given to just you. Just because we have the ability to give it to you, it doesn't mean that we should give it to you. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Um, another question that I have, uh, it's probably some sort of a, a different type of a drug, social media. Oh gosh. How do you regulate having yeah kids? <laughs> how do you deal with this addiction? Yeah. Hopefully your kids don't have it, mm -hmm. but a lot of people do. Yeah. So I have, since my children were young, have found whatever capabilities have been possible to monitor and regulate. So when they were really young, there was this one app that I was able to download, and I wish I could remember the name of it. It might come to me, but it would literally make it so their apps would all disappear from their devices <laughs> once they pass their time. Um, but as technology kind of caught up with the needs of parents, um, we're an Apple family. I don't know if you guys are Apple people, but I love Apple. And they have a lot of um, tools that are available. I actually was just teaching my best friend and my sister-in-law the different tools that are available on our, on our parental controls for the devices where we can control the amount of time used um, when the times that things aren't available and are available and they've done a very good job in the last few years of giving parents more control. Um, I also have the rule in our house where these devices aren't yours, they're mine, they're your dad's. So at any time we can always scroll, search through and scroll. And so as you know how the algorithms work, the things that you watch the most are the things that are going to pop up the most right. on your device. So we'll do a, a 10 or 15 scroll where I'm like, okay, God, I'll grab a phone. I'm like, I want to do 15 scrolls. I want to see 
what you're seeing on your device. And if I don't like it, that means that you need to change what you're watching. And so we kind of do that in a jovial way, but they know it's very serious if, they, if I hear or see something that I don't want to hear or see, um, particularly with things like TikTok, right? Because my children don't really have problems with watching things that visually are inappropriate, but auditorily I might hear a foul word pop out every once in a while and I'm like, what's going on? I right. shouldn't hear. They're like, oh, but it's, it's, it's so-and-so. I'm like, I understand. But that wouldn't pop up if you were listening to things that didn't have that in it right. constantly. I'm like, go and scroll through mommy's TikTok, mommy's Instagram, and you will not see those things because the algorithm knows what I want to hear and see. Right. So you need to make sure you're watching things that you want me to hear and see so you can keep your device. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good smart strategy. Um, you have a, a very beautiful family, thriving family, wonderful husband, great kids. Um, what would be your three or better five tips of having a great successful family? Oh goodness. Well, like I said, we're Christian, so God first. I mean I we're 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 praying on things and <sighs> reading the word together and that kind of is a thing that holds our family together, like through the good, through the bad, prayer, God, that's been the, our glue. The best times, worst times, prayer, God, that's glue. So that's our first and foremost. Um, secondary to that is communication. Uh, whether it be, and I would say two ways, communication between a husband and wife. Uh, when we are in a disagreement, we have made it a practice since our kids were young to always use our words in a way that we want our children to repeat it back to us. And if it was a way that we, we couldn't have that communication, we'd then go into a private room to have the conversation and then come back to come back in agreement in front of the children. Um, and then set with communication with our children, having conversations. Um, we do a lot of walking with our kids. If they're having a hard time, we're seeing a behavior that's not right. It's like, hey, let's go for a walk. And we find that walking and talking does a good job with trying to get through some of the hard parts. So God, communication, number three, I would say have fun. I, we really enjoy having fun in our family. We do family game challenges, family game night. We can probably get a little overly competitive. <laughs> but it's all in good fun. Uh, but it, it is a great way to spend time as a family particularly board games, trying right. to do things that are away from electronics, but getting to know each other's personalities. We're a very big Monopoly family. Nice. And our games of Monopoly can go days. <laughs> and it's very intense, but it's great. It's a great skill builder for our yeah. kids. Um, let's see. So one, two, three, four, I would say um, exposure. Mm -hmm. Exposing our kids to the world around us. So we try to you know, take them other places that they would not have otherwise been. Uh, we like to go on family vacations to like Mexico or in our church serving in our community, um, just exposing them to other peoples, other worlds so that they can have a broader view. Um, and number five, what would I say? I think forgive. I think having that core of forgiveness because you know, as the word says, we all sin and fall short, right? And um, I always emphasize to our kids, like, I'm not perfect. <laughs> and so sometimes you have to forgive me and, you know, I have to forgive you. And I think, I guess, we'll forgive apologizing, right? Keeping the family tight so that the kids understand the need to, if they are wrong, apologize. And then if someone's been wrong, to forgive. I think that kind of has always got, held us as a rock as a family. That's beautiful, beautiful pieces of advice. Uh, we've discussed these very uh, important topics, and it's not just in California, it's mm -hmm. all around the country, Definitely. and I would say in the whole world. Um, I think since we have so many media pieces that promote different values and mm -hmm. push their agenda, uh, what do you think if we start working on our own to push a non-drug yeah. agenda I love it. to promote family education, mm -hmm. education for the boys. Uh, because, yeah, in reality, men, we do have 
a lot of responsibilities. Yes. We have to, you know, take them on and not be afraid of that. And um, the, the educational system no, issue. I definitely, yeah. And, you know, the educational system issue is another one that's just near and dear to my heart. Right. It's, it's outdated. I'm living it right now with my children. And it, it, there are some big things that need to change to make it so that it's equitable for everyone, that people don't feel as less than if they don't fit into the mold that's already been pre-cut out. Well, we'll definitely be um, working on some nice pieces. I think at least it should be a documentary on each topic. Yeah. Um, better would be a, a, a mini-series or a season of episodes. Okay, sounds because good. Because when you have more content popping out, it does bring more attention, it does more influence. Yeah, for sure. So um, I'll be more than happy. I think our team would definitely uh, join our efforts in, in here in Sacramento, in Los Angeles, in Las Vegas. And uh, I do have a very, very strong belief that our projects would bring a lot of good to the community, to the society. No, I, I, I'm honored. <laughs> I'm definitely no. honored. <laughs> so am I. Um, thank you so much for coming today to our episode, uh, for sharing all of these stories and opening up, because mm -hmm. all of the stories from the family, it's, it's very personal, yeah. and our podcast is, is very personal. Yeah. <laughs> thank you so much, we wish you a beautiful weekend, and we can't wait to see you again on, in our studio. Thank you, it's been an honor. Thank you. <laughs>